Good morning and welcome to this worship time with Grace United Church in Sarnia, Ontario. My name is Sarah Brewer, my pronouns are she and her, and I am pleased to be joining you for worship this morning. Well, Kenji and Pat are both away. I'm a diaconal minister of the United Church of Canada, having served in ministry with congregations in Banff, Alberta and McGregor, Manitoba, as well as Cambrian Presbytery in Northwestern Ontario. While I search for my, own, my next call in these pandemic times, I'm enjoying the opportunity to share virtual services with United Church congregations from as far west as Banff, as far east as Montreal, and today as far south as with you here at Grace United Church, an inclusive intergenerational community partner that welcomes, affirms, and celebrates all people of every gender expression and sexual orientation seeking to show God's extensive and expansive love to everyone who is seeking a place to belong, a connection to spiritual strength, a community that asks important questions and demonstrates the compassion Jesus offered to all those he met. When I was with you for worship a few weeks ago, I acknowledge the traditional territory and people of Southern Ontario by taking you to the church where my great-great-grandfather on my dad's side of my family was first came to preach as a young minister in, from Germany in the 1800s. Today I want to introduce you to another one of my ancestors, my grandfather on my mother's side of my family tree. My maternal grandma and grandpa were missionaries among Indigenous people here in Canada. They worked for many years in northern Alberta, BC, and up into the territories before my mother and her sisters were born. After moving their young family back to Ontario, my grandfather continued his work here. Following my grandpa's death in 1981, my family self-published his memoir, which includes a poem he wrote almost 50 years ago. The language in this poem is dated, yet I share it with you today as the direct observation of one missionary about the harms European settlers had caused to Indigenous people. Wide were the expanses over which they roamed, where they pitched their tent, there it was their home. By white man's virtues, values their possessions were but few, but not being plagued by greed, their necessities would do. Their contentment was not in the abundance they possessed, but having the necessities of life they deemed themselves blessed. From off the land God gave them, they did readily find, sufficient for every need, in abundance of every kind. The rushing streams yielded them fish to eat, the forest and plain supplied them with their meat. From the skins of animals garments were made to wear, and no one suffered want, for their law was one of share. Unto such people the white man did come, and in the name of Christianity has taken from them the right to native custom as well as liberty, leaving them destitute in want and poverty. From such people we have claimed their land. We have left them hopeless and destitute on every hand. And we have justified our actions with this pious claim. To civilize, to Christianize, was our holy aim. A danger in sharing this historic poem with you today is that it might leave you thinking that these harms are of the past. But we know they are not. Still today, Indigenous people experience many injustices lack of clean water on some reserves. Indigenous schools receive less funding. Indigenous people are harassed by police. Indigenous women and children are murdered. And the list continues. So as we gather to worship today, we begin by acknowledging these injustices, past and present, and we recommit ourselves, settlers and Indigenous people alike, to the work that lies before us to ensure a different future for this land, the water, the plants, the people, and the animals who will follow us here. May it be so. Amen. Well, 
When he was teaching, Jesus often used parables, which are kind of a cross between a story and a metaphor to make his point. We're going to be considering some parables together in worship today. So as we settle ourselves into this time of worship, I want to begin with a short excerpt from James Taylor's book, Everyday Parables, in which he writes, the flicker of a flame in a campfire is hypnotic. The light itself dances with your imagination. Around a campfire, there's no need for conversation. So conversation often flows more freely. You can sit for hours watching the coals glow and crackle. But if you pull one of those embers out of the fire, it soon grows cold. That's probably why we need to gather in communities. Each of us can glow individually, but without the reinforcement of others glowing around us, we can, too, grow cold. Any kind of people who share similar goals and ideals will serve as community. But the gathering of those who think of themselves as the people of God, a church, has some special qualities. For as long as humans have existed, fire has been a symbol for God. God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush and to the followers of Jesus in tongues of flame. We also follow the example of Jesus who said, I am the light of the world. So we take a moment now to light our candles, to remember that we are not alone. God is with us.
In Everyday Parables, Jim Taylor also writes about coffee urns. About them, he says this, Coffee urns squat on counters like shiny fire hydrants with indigestion. They gurgle and burp, and burgle and gurp, and eventually produce a more or less drinkable fluid. We can learn a lot about spiritual growth from coffee urns. Like them, we only produce something valuable when we're plugged into a source of power. For the coffee urn, it's electricity. For the Christian, it's God. So here we are today, seeking to plug ourselves into the source of life and power. Let us do that as we worship our God. Like a river of tears, your love pours upon us, like a sunshine of blessing, your grace will sustain us, like a star-studded sky, your spirit shines over us, renew Like a bird in free flight by windows around us, like a wind in the forest that breathes life among us, like a phoenix that's rising from ashes around us. Renew At this point in our service, people in Zoom have gone into breakout rooms to share the peace of Christ with one another. As they do that, I would like to take a moment now to extend the peace of Christ to each of you, wherever and whenever you may be watching this. If you are watching with someone else, I invite you to take a moment and offer a greeting of peace to them. 
If you're living on your own, perhaps you can make a call or send an email or text to someone after the service. In keeping with our theme about parables for worship today, the folks on Zoom have been invited to look around the space they're in to pick an object to share with one another in a quick bit of show and tell. If you are outside, maybe like me, that's a patch of rhubarb in your garden. Or if you're inside, it might be something like the coffee mug on your table or your cat. I wonder what's in the space where you are. Have a look around and pick something now. A long time ago now, when I was a child, the church that I went to had a junior choir. It was a special choir for those of us who were younger than a lot of the people in the church. My dad was the choir director, so we used to practice in our, my basement in his studio. I liked singing in the choir, and I still remember a lot of the songs I learned when I was in it. One of them was a really simple tune. It went like this. God is like a flashlight shining in the dark, shining in the dark, in the dark. God is like a flashlight shining in the dark. That's what God is like. There were other verses too. One of them started out, God is like a mother giving me a hug. The fun part of that song was that besides singing some of the real verses, we also got to make up a few verses of our own. Mostly they were pretty silly. The one I remember is that God was like an elephant, really, really big. Earlier in our service today, I mentioned parables. They're a kind of story that Jesus used to tell people. Instead of starting with once upon a time, they usually started with God is like, or maybe faith is like. 
Then Jesus would talk about ordinary things like seeds and bread that people would understand. And then after, he, after the start, he would tell people why. So he might say something like, God is like oxygen. We can't see God, but we also can't live without God. Or faith is like a muscle. You have to work at it to make it strong. So now I'm going to invite you to create your own parable. Earlier, you picked an object in the space where you are, and that will become the focus of your parable if you want. The next part is to think about that thing that you picked and how you could use it to tell someone something about God. So if, for example, you picked a family portrait, you might say that your family is like the church, full of people who are trying to bring out the best in one another. In my case, I picked my cat, but she's not here with me outside. So my parable is going to be that faith is like my cat. Sometimes it makes me feel good, but it also expects a lot out of me. Now it's your turn. What object did you pick? How might it be like God or Jesus or the Bible or church or faith or prayer? I really wish I could hear your answers. Since I can't, I'm going to tell you one more of the parables that James Taylor wrote in his book. He says, when you first dump a jigsaw puzzle out onto a table, it looks like a hopeless mess. At first glance, nothing matches, nothing fits together, and the bigger the puzzle, the more hopeless the task seems. The Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle with an infinite number of pieces. It has 66 books assembled by an unknown number of writers and editors. Each book has hundreds of messages. When you first dump open the Bible to see what you've got, it looks like a hopeless mess. All those bits and pieces don't seem to match with other bits and pieces. Initially, you try to make sense out of a verse here and a verse there, like trying to find the corner or an edge piece on a puzzle. But once you start putting pieces together, it starts to make more and more sense. And the more pieces you put together, the better it looks. On that note, it's time for us now to listen to our piece of the Bible for today. A reading from Mark chapter four, verses 26 to 34. Listen for the inspired word of God. Again, Jesus said, God's kingdom is like what happens when a farmer scatters seed in a field. The farmer sleeps at night and is up and around during the day, yet the seeds keep sprouting and growing, and he doesn't understand how. It is the ground that makes the seeds sprout and grow into plants that produce grain. Then when harvest season comes and the grain is ripe, the farmer cuts it with a sickle. Finally, Jesus said, what is God's kingdom like? What story can I use to explain? It is like what happens when the mustard seed is planted in the ground. It is the smallest seed in the world, but once it is planted, it grows larger than any other garden plant. It even puts out branches that are big enough for birds to nest in its shade. Jesus used many other stories when he spoke to the people and he taught them as much as they could understand. He did not tell them anything without using stories. But when he was left alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. Let us pray. Loving and beloved God, you surround us with reminders of your impact in our ordinary lives and in our world every day. As we settle now into this time of reflection, remind us again of your presence with us. May the words from my mouth and the thoughts they stir in all of our hearts 
be a faithful reflection of you, our strength and our sustainer. Amen. So friends, when I was first imagining the service for today and considering what might be meaningful for you from it, I envisioned a playful and pleasant experience. If all went well, we'd be just about to move into phase one of COVID restrictions being lifted here in Ontario. We're also nearing the summer solstice, so there'd be joy about summer activities like gardening, canoeing, reading on the deck and days at the beach. Children and the adults who work with them would be counting down the days to the end of a challenging school year. And when I was imagining that context, the story we heard today seemed like a perfect find for a light-hearted service about parables. Yet while all of those things are true, we've also encountered other truths these past weeks that have left many people needing more than a light-hearted service that is playful and pleasant. As we grapple with the horrific news these past two weeks about multiple acts of fear and hatred that have resulted in violence and vandalism, it is normal for a people of faith to be wondering, where is God in this mess? It reminds me of a story Eli Wiesel tells in his book, Night, about the horrors in Germany during the Nazi regime. When a horrific experience witnessed by many in the Jewish concentration camp left people calling out, where is God now? Perhaps instead of a service about parables, it might have been more appropriate to rewrite a service about Psalms, specifically the Psalms of Lament. In one of the better known songs of faith, Psalm 22, Someone cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. If you're familiar with the Bible story about the day that Jesus died, you might know that Jesus himself is said to have echoed these words from the cross. This reminds me that while we sometimes assume it's unfaithful to question God, Questions are in fact a very real act of faith. To challenge and question someone you care about assumes a depth of relationship. And in times like these, the spiritual practice of lament can serve us well. Yet, as I continued to reflect on the theme of parables that I'd chosen for this service, I was also surprised by an insight that perhaps they too served us well in times like this. Each time I found myself wondering, where is God in this tragedy? An answer emerged in the form of a modern day parable. As Eli Weasel concludes his story about people in a concentration camp wondering where God was, he heard a voice within him respond, that God is right here, suffering with us. I wonder if the spiritual discipline of modern day parables doesn't give us a way to respond similarly. My heart hurt when I heard about a gay man who was beat up on Toronto Island and pride flags that have been stolen and vandalized in various Southern Ontario communities this week. In moments like this, God weeps. Yet I also saw this parable of hope. God's love is like a group of teenagers in Guelph, who upon hearing that a pride flag at a school in their community had been vandalized, showed up with chalk to put out a colorful and cheerful counter message of love because we saw it and we knew we had to do something about it. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I grieved when I heard that someone's Islamophobia left a nine-year-old child orphaned and in a hospital in London this week. 
And I trust that God is sitting vigil at that child's bedside. Yet I also remember that the kingdom of God is like the ordinary Canadians of all faiths and no faiths who have shown up at vigils in communities large and small across Canada to surround the Muslim community in solidarity and support. God's way is one where we love our neighbours. My prayers are with all those who have been impacted by the COVID pandemic, especially with friends in Manitoba who are in the midst of their third wave, and with all others around the world where numbers are high at the moment. This past year has been hard in so many ways and most of us are exhausted. Yet despite the exhaustion, and despite a provincially based healthcare system, healthcare practitioners have taken turns helping one another where the need was greatest. While maritime medical staff came to support Ontario last month, this month Ontario is one of several provinces who are helping to support Manitoba. That's what the body of Christ is like. We all work together and we support one another for the good of the whole. I feel remorse and worry that five years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, there are still many settler Canadians who know little about residential schools. I hear the words of one of the survivors of those schools who told the last United Church General Council, we're growing old now, and we won't always be here to remind you of our stories. Yet grace abounds and calls settlers to become like the city councillors in Victoria, BC, who in response to the news from Kamloops last week, voted unanimously to cancel their planned online Canada Day celebration so that instead a thoughtful reflection guided by local indigenous, indigenous leaders on the realities of colonialism past and present might take place. Now, to be perfectly clear, these contemporary parables don't replace the hurt and the grief that any of us might be feeling this week. What they can do, however, is remind us that God is with us in it all. That's what Jesus did for the disciples when he told them stories about seeds growing without the farmer knowing how it happened, and the smallest of seeds producing a bush that offered shade to birds. He reminded them that God was with them in the ordinary yet significant ways, in the midst of their everyday lives, with all the heartache and struggle. What we sometimes forget when we read the stories of Jesus is the tense economic and political climate in which he lived and taught. The Jewish people were an occupied nation within the Roman Empire, and many of Jesus' followers were poor people struggling to find enough food and shelter to get by in a crippling economy. His stories didn't immediately solve all their problems, nor did they make the world all better. Yet what they did do was invite his followers to notice the glimpses of hope and to nurture the seeds of possibility that come from the presence of God right there with them in the middle of the pain and grief and fear and worry. The challenge, of course, with parables is that the ordinary things from one time and place might not make sense to people in another time and place. Just as the modern parables I shared with you a few moments ago likely won't make sense to someone who happened upon them this sermon 500 years from now, the lives of Jewish people in Palestine 2,000 years ago don't always make sense to us today. In the parables we heard today, we're lucky enough to hear about the concept of seeds, which most of us still do understand enough to know that when placed in the ground, they tend to sprout and grow. 
But if we don't know, or we forget about the context in which Jesus shared these images, we might miss the point. In an occupied country, a story about a seed growing underground in unseen ways might, for example, not just be about a seed growing underground, but also the seeds of resistance. Likewise, a story about a tiny, insignificant seed like a mustard seed, which can grow to provide shelter and safety, might have been a reminder that though one feels like one's own life doesn't matter, each small act of resistance held the potential of making a large difference. Which brings us back to our text, or to our lives today. These are challenging times, and you may have many feelings about them. Parables can't right all the wrongs, but they do remind us that we are not alone in them. God is with us in the ordinary, everyday moments of life, which the spiritual discipline of creating modern-day parables encourages us to remember. But even more, as the parables of Jesus today remind us, in the midst of troubled times, our small acts of resistance can change the world. So, as you head into this coming week, may the parables you find in your life nurture you and inspire you to go and be a parable in this world. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Storytelling God, we give thanks for all the ways in which we experience your presence in our everyday lives. Everything and everyone we encounter offers us an opportunity to learn about you from loaves of bread to grains of wheat, from campfires to flashlights, from potato peelers to soup pots, from weeds by the side of the road to birds singing in the tree. Everything is filled with your glory. Every little thing can be our teacher. Help us to notice all the places for wonder in our daily lives. 
Storytelling God. Teach us to tell the stories of our own lives with truth and love, trusting that you are revealed in the story of each person that we meet along life's way. Help us to listen well to one another, accepting each person as they are and looking for that which is unique and precious in the lives of those closest to us and those people who seem very different from us. This week especially, we remember and lament the harms that happen when we forget to see your presence in one another. And so we bring our prayers in words that we will follow up with prayers in action. For the family and friends of the Salman Afzal family in London, especially their surviving child in the midst of his healing and all of their grief. For Indigenous peoples, especially those for whom last week's news was not news, but rather confirmation of something that they have long known. For the queer community, especially those who have been impacted by vandalism and violence in recent weeks. Storytelling God. Sometimes the stories of our lives are challenging. In those moments, help us to find the resources we need to carry on in faith. Give us the courage to ask for help and the grace to receive care from others. Storytelling God, we pray this day for those whose stories are known to us who are rejoicing this day. As a community, we remember those who may be celebrating a birth, a marriage, or a graduation this month. We pray also for those who are facing times of struggle. As a community, we remember especially Audrey and Brian, Helen, Kelly, Lauren, Eric, Michelle, Rob, Dave. And in a moment of shared silence, we add also the prayers that we carry individually in our hearts today. Storytelling God, enfold us again in your great story as we share the words of prayer that Jesus taught his friends to say. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, 
as our time of worship draws to a close and we return to the rest of our lives, may you do so remembering that the world around you is filled with everyday parables. Even in the most challenging of times, God is with us. So as you go, may the love of God warm you like the summer sun. May the stories of Jesus guide you like a map. And may God's spirit dance through your life like the wind rustling in the trees. Today and always. Amen.